Kelly, do you want to switch off sound and vision? Yep, I can, sorry. Just for a moment. Welcome to Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, the Handspring monthly webinar that's a discussion in advance of the 2021 publication of Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, Case Reports and Perspectives, co-edited by Madeline Black and Elizabeth Larkham. Our guest today and expert contributing author is Kelly Kane, who's a movement maverick and the uh, founder of the Kelly Kane Movement School in New York City. Before Madeline introduces Kelly, and they have been friends, colleagues, um, collaborators for decades, let's look at a slide that explains how the webinar works. The chat is on, so please do say hello and tell us where you're joining from. We welcome your questions, and please submit those questions using the Q&A button on your screen rather than the chat, and Kelly will answer um, your questions. The webinar will comprise about 45 minutes of mixed discussion and practice, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. For your practice, it will be useful to have um, paper plates or tea towels, um, you could have a dowel or a broomstick at the ready and perhaps a foam roller as well. We're due to finish on the hour, which will be uh, 9 a.m., 12 p.m. or 5 p.m., but we'll, Kelly will be happy to go a bit 10 minutes after the hour in order to answer the rest of your questions and engage in discussion. The webinar is being recorded and Handspring will share a link to the recording in the follow-up email. The webinar is also streaming live on YouTube. And we have a disclaimer, just is to remind you that the, this discussion is for informational and illustrative purposes only, and is not meant to impart medical or therapeutic advice. Madeline, over to you to introduce Kelly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Kelly, the biggest heart and hugs to you. Um, Thank you, sister. Yeah, as Elizabeth said, she and I have been on this journey together uh, with the body and more uh, for decades. Um, but uh, I'd like to share with you that Kelly had studied Pilates originally with Ramana Krizanwaska. I can never say her name properly, <laughs> sorry, 
Uh, and Hilda Paldi, uh, and completing her certification at the Pilates Institute. She studied body-mind centering, continuum movement, Iyengar yoga, and has done extensive CrossFit training. She also attended massage school at the Florida State, uh, the Florida School of Massage. Uh, Kelly's manual therapy repertoire includes uh, structural integration, uh, cranial sacral therapy, and visceral manipulation. She further developed her perceptional skills through three years of human cadaver uh, dissection. <clears throat> In 1999, Kelly opened the Kane School of Core Integration in New York City. The teacher training program at the Kane School are singular in their emphasis on developing the teacher's anatomical knowledge and palpatory skills while exacting an understanding of the classic Pilates repertory. Kelly is sought after and continued education provider and lecturer in the States and abroad and has presented at the Pilates Style Conference, the ECA World Fitness, Pilates Method Alliance Conference, the Australian Pilates Method Alliance Conference, Pilates on Tour, among others. Presenting specialized workshops on the biomechanics and anatomy <clears throat> of the shoulder, neck, lumbar pelvic girdle, pelvic floor, and feet. Giving students the real tools to apply what they learn to their clients in highly effective ways. Kelly directs the Kane School Teacher Training Program in New York City, but currently resides in Vermont, which is where she's coming from here. Uh, and she teaches Pilates at the Biscuit Hill Pilates in Woodstock, Vermont, and conducts trainings online. So Kelly, welcome to our webinar. And uh, we're also grateful for your contribution to the upcoming book. So Thank you. to start, you're welcome. And to start the conversation, um, since we've had many, and they're always so stimulating and interesting, um, let's, let's talk about what does constitutes healthy aging? Well, I mean, there's, you know, the World Health Organization um, talks about specific criterion. I think that there are general um, criterion that are considered to be, you know, ways that people engage in health as young people, but then continue to engage in health over our lifetime um, that have to do with moving and social emotional health and engagement and um, eating well and figuring out to how to adjust and adapt to stress. Um, you know, bonding with people is a huge contributor to increased immunity and overall well being. Um, breathing is one of the things I think about in personal practice, like commitment to self care and personal practice. I often think about all the systems. So, like I'm talking about, like what is considered to be um, some of the criterion for aging well. But I always think about systems, right? I think about my capacity to breathe well. I think about my capacity to metabolize my nutrients, my capacity to balance my home hormones, either through lifestyle medicine choices or through um, you know, the arc of my life and my hormonal health. Um, I think about my fascial systems and my cellular systems and my, um, my sexual well-being, right? And my sexual well-being in relationship to myself because my sexual well-being is mine. And then when I, once I have that well created and I connect to it, then I can relate that to other people, right? Um, my intellect. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we are, we're all you know, all of us, you know, Elizabeth, myself, and you were all very much engaged in our, like this propensity to research and collect information and share information. And I mean, I think this is one of the things we were just talking about too, Elizabeth and Madeline is this idea is as we age, I've become very invested in um, my connection to the community. And it's one of the things I find really compelling is that often men will, um, you know, their power increases 
the community power increases as they age. And for women, that isn't often the case. And I like to say I'm over it, right? Because <laughs> I like the amount of wisdom we have here, the amount of wisdom that women bring to the conversation as they age, planetary wisdom, mother wisdom, movement wisdom, emotional wisdom, um, and, and how we br pull up people behind us and push people in front of us um, is also something that I'm really much more engaged in as I age. I mentor kids and people in the Pilates world. And, and then I also really am invested in connecting to people who are older than me. And I really feel like there's an opportunity there. Does that answer my personal? <laughs> yeah, that's great. It certainly <laughs> does. You know, as, as we, we were talking too, I mean, we're always aging. So the minute you're born, right, you're, you're uh, always aging. And so what defines the, the line? Is it AARP sending you something in the mail at age 55 and now you're considered the category of an older person? Um, so trying to distinguish, you know, you know, what is that difference? How come I turned 55 and now all of a sudden my, I'm supposed to change and be a little bit different? So let's speak about like, what does healthy aging look like, Kelly? Well, I think, you know, I think this is the thing. I think that our out, that a lot of what we see in media is super outdated. I mean, the, we are at a time and I think that we would all agree that the old paradigms are dissolving away or being pushed away <laughs> or um, being butted up against, right? And one of, you know, I think with Me Too and BIPOC and, you know, um, the various movements, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's just like the old way of doing things are dissolving away. It, at least that's my hope. And I think this idea that aging is, has inherent deficits Mm -hmm. And that's what's in the foreground of the conversation is just doesn't do justice to everything that we gain as older people, right? It's like we gain wisdom and we gain self-satisfaction. What a concept, right? Self-satisfaction is one of the things that many older people report through, you know, through their 70s and 80s. And so um, I just, I feel like those, the you know I, god bless aarp but they got to update their you know their visual because that doesn't represent us like do you feel like mm -hmm. that re represents you it doesn't re represent you or me not at all mm -mm. and so there's there's this idea that um you know there's this inherent decline you know which you know there's some things that, that decline but there's other things that really expand as we age and i think a lot of it has to do with satisfaction and mentorship. And um, I think also moving appropriately and differently is a really important thing to think about. And I think it's it, the, the, what healthy aging looks like is really relative to the person, the individual. Yeah. And, and then mm -hmm. what's their body history? Mm -hmm. So when we think about the generation, if we're talking about 55 and up, or even the people 70s, it's a different generation and mindset in terms of a physical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, today, you know, more younger people are really, you know, working out and, you know, really having that kind of practice more so than those who were raised in the 50s. Mm -hmm. 40s 50s right they they mm -hmm. that was not the mindset of people going to a gym and being physical uh and so it's a different mentality so the history of your body you know if you've been active your whole life and you as you were saying and eating well and things like that then hopefully you know without some disease or genetic something right that your body is already developed in this aging process right it's it's strong mm -hmm you know, and you just have to maintain, you actually have to do more maintenance, more self care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the idea of self care, how, you know, people think that's a luxury mm -hmm. to do that. Or is that I say it's a necessity, like brushing your teeth, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So it, it's that history. Can you uh, speak a little bit about your population in Vermont? 
Yes, but so, their history is different than the people in California where we are. The lifestyle yes. is very different. Yeah, so, I mean, this, you know, m one of the things, so in terms of my Pilates teaching experience, um, m when I worked in New York, which I did for in New York City for the good part of 30 years, um, I mostly worked with um, dancers you know, professional dancers, that's who I worked with. And, you know, I worked with all populations, but because I did, I've done teacher training in New York for that amount of time. And because of the kind of like somatic um, background that I have and um, the anatomy background and biomechanics, um, I just landed with, uh, you know, the real athletes in New York City of which they're dancers, a lot of them. And so moving to Vermont, um, it, I started to work almost exclusively with people over 65. And, um, you know, when I came into the Pilates studio that I work in now, um, the, the community was being provided very good Pilates, like really great Pilates. Like the, the woman who owns the studio, Deanna Bush, she provides great, great Pilates. But I started to... Um, think about like, what are the challenges of this community, right? So I'm coming into a community that is already being provided very good care. And the thing I really squarely landed on is um, that I wanted to ensure that, that if this population fell, which I've fallen every single winter that I've lived in New York, I've done, I mean, in Vermont, I've done one of these things where my feet fly up and I land <laughs> because the cycle of winter here is you get snow and it's gorgeous and then you get torrential rain and then you get ice and then you get snow. It's just how winters go here. So based on the information I already had about how to keep people strong through life, I started to say, well, I'm gonna to start to orient my thinking around this population based on the fact that I know that mortality is 75% higher once you've had a hip fracture or a fall, right? Fall slash hip fracture. So I started to be like, I wanna make sure that I am training this population um, around dexterity in their movement, right? So their balance, flexibility, and strength. Um, their adaptability to external environments and their own internal environment so that if they're challenged in some way internally or externally, that they know how to adjust and adapt. I wanted to make sure that they had, that I worked towards um, creating gluteal mass and strength in their arms, right? So um, that's one of the things I, I started to really get proactive about. Um, and I wanted to create situations in the studio that were a little dangerous. <laughs> like not, you know, meaning that, you know, that like sometimes I would use the orbit like standing and we're gonna use paper plates. Like I would use like sliders, you know, sometimes we call them sliders, but I would have someone with doing like a lunge with their foot on the, on the orbit, which is unstable. And, you know, where the, the building is a little, the floor of the building is a little wavy. So there was variables. I mean, when I say dangerous, you know, I'm being a little flipper, but I wanted to create, um, I wanted to create situations where things weren't completely predictable and then the clients would have to adjust and adapt and I could help them through that. Um, so that was, I think mostly how I thought about it. Also, I'm a big fan of what I like to think of as like um, just bonding through movement, creating community through movement. I think this is one of the things that, that we all have done. And it's something that I didn't really understand that I've always done until I moved here because my, all my communities here, I don't have a ton of, I live in a very isolated place. I don't have a ton of community in a way. And all of my communities I've, developed through movement, mountain biking, snowboarding, paddle boarding, Pilates, you know, that's how I've developed uh, my community. And then 
I also like to call this thing, I like to call out fear bonding, right? So engaging in some kind of crazy adventure and then, you know, there's all like some kind of fearful, like we're going to do it. And then there's bonding that happens. And, um, and I like to, to, I wanted to cultivate that at the studio as well. Not fear bonding per se, but the community in the studio. Yeah. So someone who maybe has, you know, uh, you know, fear or, um, you know, to challenge them to do something a little dangerous or a little bit outside of their comfort zone, basically, is not mm-hmm. that it's dangerous, right? Yeah. And then that bonding part. So you're, you're really stimulating, you know, the multiple systems of the body, but at the same time that, that connection, you know, uh, with another person, which you have, you know, talked about the importance of that for um, longevity. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the research on longevity? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I'm just going to talk about this one um, client I had many for many years in New York, and he used to come to the studio and, you know, he was in his mid-70s and he'd chat up the front desk. He was very dapper and, and um, very, um, you know, he was, he's, he was great at, like, the art of conversation, right? Like, I, I often used to think about how that's one of the things I learned from him is, is the art of conversation, not just speaking to someone or speaking at someone, but listening and conversing back and forth. And he would do that with the front desk. And then we would do our session and he would chat me up so much. And I was like, listen, I'm just going to call him Bob. I was like, Bob, um, you know, we can't chat this much. I love chatting you up, but, um, you know, we've got a lot to I got a lot to do with you. He had Parkinson's and I wanted to get a lot done. And he said to me, you know, the, and I tell this story and I saw some people who are on this call who've gone through my teacher training, which is really exciting. But one of the things he said to me, he was like, you know, one of the main reasons I come here is to talk to you guys. And it's part of how I think about my health. And, you know, I come in this place and all these beautiful women and, you know, he wasn't, at all crossing any boundaries but he was like all these beautiful women are chatting me up and it makes me feel really good like it's part of a big part of why I come here and I was like all right I got you (laughs) so I was like I'm okay with that and he said that also we didn't I didn't provide 45 minute sessions um he said I always think about chatting you up for 15 minutes because if I have a 45 minute session then I feel great the next day and if I have an hour session, I tend to feel too tired the next day. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, all right. So that story illuminates one of, you know, we will we'll bring up the table at some point, but this, you know, 75 year um, study, it's called the Harvard Study of Art Adult Development, I think. Um, I couldn't print, print it out because my printer isn't working this morning, but I can pull up the, um, the details of the study. And I think on our uh, table, there is the um, name of the study. And it's a 75-year study that was, um, was led by many people over many different years, right? So here's the table of it. And this was illuminated in Business Insider, but I'll get the name of the actual study. And it's the guy who, who is now um, at the helm of the study because it's continuing on, he wrote a book called Aging Well. And, um, you know, they followed, first of all, men until the 90s, right? So it's a 75, it's a study going back 75 years. And um, what they found, like the, the in final analysis with the study is that um, although people started as in their 20s as wanting very specific things in their lives, many people said they wanted money and fame. And it's often what pe- millennials are often um, quoted as saying that's what they want to as, 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 you know, looking forward to the end of their life is money and fame. But um, the, in this study, what they found is that people who had the most fulfilling lives over the full arc of their life had successful and bonded relationships. 
either to their spouses or their children or their community. And, um, and in meaning too, that they felt safe and supported in those relationships. And a lot of times the relationship wouldn't necessarily look like a super healthy relationship. There could be banter and bitching and, you know, like maybe that kind of stuff we see, see with long-term relationships. But the people who were in those relationships felt supported and safe. And so what they found is that there were real benefits to their immune system, to their cognitive function, to um, their basic emotional and uh, uh, social emotional engagement system, um, they, how they created meaning around their lives, how they continued to create meaning around their lives as they aged. Um, and so I, I, the reason I brought this up is because this, study is referenced all the time. It's just referenced all the time. And I think it's, I think it's important that, that this illuminates something which is really consistent through research, of, you know, in research throughout time is that it's mostly done on men, right? And so, you know, women are not just small men or you know, we're different. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's, it would be useful to see this kind of research done. And they're starting to include women, I think, since, since the 90s. But I think that this, um, this is an interesting, an interesting table. I so think it's, you, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's like a trajectory, a certain story, a narrative. It's a trajectory for some, this, this population. It's not necessarily yeah. the trajectory of people like women and people of color, or, you know, other people yeah. living in other parts of the world, you know, how, mm -hmm. what their lives are like, but, um, but to know that there's a point in your life and I can feel it, you know, now that I'm in my sixties, you know, what's important to me, you know, when I was in my thirties is different now, you know, and you become a little more, um, you know, expansive, inclusive, wanting connection, um, which of course now is difficult. We can't connect very well uh, outside of a screen or six feet away. But um, but you see that trajectory in terms of a person's lifespan. And I think it would be interesting for younger people to actually you know look at this in some form. But their narrative would be different, possibly. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, I think what's compelling about this is that life satisfaction median age is sixty nine. Sixty nine. Right, so that's major <laughs> to be to be satisfied with your life. Like we get that at 69. Our vocabulary <laughs> is most complex at 71, right? Happiness with our body reported at 74. Reported at 74. <laughs> Psychological well-being 82, right? So all the, all the, like the icing, all the juicy, delicious things that we're waiting for our whole life, right? We get in older age. And yet that's not the narrative around what aging is like, because it's focused on what we look like, right? For women, what, right. like how we can produce as men, right? So, um, and for, you know, people who identify as women who, and, and who identify as men, it's, it's like, it's, it's different, you know, it's different than what the primary narrative is in popular culture, I would say. Right, exactly. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the language since you're kind of mentioning that a little bit uh, in, in how, you know, I think about, you know, even just recently, I know I'm bringing up some news, but, you know, Diane Feinstein, our senator in California, she's 88, I think, or 89. <clears throat> and she, she got reelected to a six-year term. So she's going to be like 92, but there's like people questioning her because of her age, you see, and because there's supposed to be this decline at a certain age, you know, and, and mm -hmm. there is a whole language. And in the fitness industry, since we're talking about movement and physical training and all of that, definitely you get these magazines from that industry and they're telling you how to train your elderly clients, you know, and what precaution, that limitation for the person. So, 
it, let, I'd love to talk more about how we can be more conscious about our language in referring to our older uh, clients, specifically for the teachers who are, who are working with them, want to be one-on-one -on -one and in class. How can we be more conscious about how we reference uh, that? What are your thoughts on that, Kelly? Well, I, just, I mean, this is one of the things that is confusing to me because I do use the, the, the words aging well. Um, I also tend to, I, but I don't even, so there's part of that I don't, uh, I don't love either because it's, it's also like it assumes that there's a way to not age well, which I don't know. I just feel somehow not totally inclusive. I think that there is the term millennials, and so perennials is a term that's being bandied about um, to refer to our generation as people in the 50s and beyond. And um, I think that, you know, I guess I just always am looking um, at my clients and myself as we go beyond 55. Like, I'm trying to think about it as an opportunity. And I try to think about creating this um, environment of curiosity and exploration, right? And limitless possibility as opposed to being like, oh, with your older clients, you have to work them out in a chair and you have to like that whole thing. I was like, always like, that was so confusing to me when I, when I, um, when I learned some of that stuff a long time ago, I was like, wait a minute, I don't think people should be sitting anymore. You know, like we, as we've talked about in our industry and in the fitness industry is that sitting is the new smoking. And um, I think that there has to be like this, this idea that physical health, or this is my idea, is a process. And it's not something that is like uh, the, 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 a bell curve, <laughs> right? But it's a continuous process, right? And there's deviations on the line and there's ups and downs, but it's not something that's apex to decline, right? It just changes over time. And I think as we get older, um, I wanna be curious and excited and try new things. and. I know for myself and for a lot of my clients, we think about working more and moving more as we age. So um, I tend to think about working out at least an hour every day. And many of my older clients work out, whatever that means, um, for two to three hours every day. My 89-year-old client who rides her horses and works out with me and works out with um, other Pilates people and um, walks her dog. She works out three or four hours a day. Like she's engaged in real movement three or four hours a day. And she trailer her horse, she trailers her horses different places and rides in the woods. And, and I think that that, um, to me, it's like the language should not be limiting. It should be this idea that we are ever expansive. And just how we adjust to what our personal story, to your point, Madeline, um, like what our personal story is around movement adjusts over time, right? And that's just, it's not. And it's convincing. I, for me, it's like working with, uh, in Sonoma, we have an elderly population as well. It's the elderly, older, yeah. aging. I don't know. So there's the language again, just that yeah. unconscious word that I don't like that word, to be, to be honest with you. But um it's there have some fear. Oh, I've been told that I shouldn't, you know, do X because I have Y, you know, or, or I, I'm getting older. So therefore I'm told I shouldn't do this particular movement or anything. So it, it's for a teacher, we're having to try to shift that narrative when we are confident that we can mm -hmm. see their body, we understand movement. So I'm coming from an educated place that I know they can move you know, get them up on that reformer and, that, and, you know, get the carriage to move. You're there to support them, right? Safety. Mm -hmm. You've talked mm -hmm. about safety and, you know, but to convince them to kind of go a little bit past what their brain, because whatever they've read in terms of, um, you know, what they should or should not be doing in terms of that. 
Yeah, and I think this this is also kind of one of the mandates of of like classic allopathic medical care is that you abdicate responsibility for your own health and well-being and you put it in someone else's hands, which is just, it's so outdated. It's just not, you know, and, and for me, that's one of the things I feel like I'm always trying to relocate my clients back into their own personal experience and then help them to strengthen whatever, um, you know, wherever they feel their deficits are, or, you know, I'm not necessarily being like, where are your deficits, but where I see they feel nervous about hiking, right? Or they feel nervous about um, stepping up onto something, or they feel nervous about single leg stance and gait, or they feel nervous um, in terms of their visual field and moving their head when they're in an unstable situation. So I think that I think one of the things I continuously am struggling against is that kind of old school idea that your health belongs to someone else or that they ha they are more the expert than you are. And that's not the case. I mean, people create their team, right? Many of my people, I feel like one of their strategies has been like, like, this is my experience. This is my body. This is my physicality, but I'm going to pull together my team. Kelly, you're part of my team. Maddie, you're part of my team. And then you have facilitators, right? But you are the, you're driving, right? And I think that that should, from my perspective, that's the model of healthcare that I try to um, engage in for myself and for my community. Great. Let, can we uh, start talking about your um, process of training, you know, so the mm -hmm. physical training aspect of it um, in terms yeah. of uh, we talked about how growth happens through challenge, you know, so when we mm -hmm. challenge ourselves or challenge our clients um, and then the scale of, you know, just how you go from easy to harder or harder to easier. And then what's your programming variabilities that you tend to use? more frequently. Yeah. So I, one of the things I think about a lot, just in terms of training is pace, right? So what, one of the things that happens for any of us is that pace can be something that changes from day to day and over a lifetime. So um, like I'm in a slow pace right now because I have a really serious degrading knee and I'm just going slow with everything because if I go slow, I'm okay, right? My knee is happy. Whereas I like to kind of do quick burpees and run around and move quick these days. Um, that's not, that's not what I do. And so I often think about like, um, where is someone's personal pace? In, in constitutionally, but from day to day, like what is their pace? Do they, do, can we move quick today? Can, do we need to slow it down, right? One of the things too that we, Madeline, you and I didn't talk about so much, but I think is a really, has been a really important um, kind of programming thing theme for me is instead of pushing, pulling, right? Because if someone has compression or arthritic changes or any kind of, um, you know, you know, reduce cartilage or any rigidity through any of their joints. If you, if you're pulling, especially pulling your body weight, it can help to distract the joints. So like a lot of times I think about how do I create challenges through pulling um, because it reduces compression and possibly can give you a little distraction through the capsular pieces of a joint, which then is often how I think about training someone from like deep or more centrally to superficial or more globally, right? And so um, that's one of the things I think a lot about is doing pulling. Um, I think often uh, about hypertrophy, especially as we age, because sarcopenia is the gradual the, you know, um, loss of muscle mass over time. And it's thought that beyond it, I mean, this is kind of, there's different percentages, but over the age of 30, it's thought you that one loses three to 15% of your total muscle mass every decade. Sometimes it's every eight years, you know, there's like certain variables, but let's just say over time, you're losing the amount of muscle fibers that you actually have available to you to recruit, unless you're proactively working at it, 
So it's like we could think about 30 as the age where we, we really need to start to think about being vigilant about our muscle mass and, ch and, and changing up our, like what we do, right? It's like, I think all of us, we're always changing things up. The Pilates industry is always changing things up. We got balls and ooze and orbits and um, the Pilates wheel I looked at yesterday. And so there's all different variations that help to create dexterity in our training programs. So that dexterity gets, gets, um, uh, that dexterity becomes adaptability. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying it exactly right. But I think if we think about adaptability as one of the primary focuses of how we should be training over time, um, I think that changing things up helps to create adaptability. Balance. Did I miss something? No, let's move though. Let's do some <laughs> movement. Okay. Let's, I'm getting antsy listening to you. It's like, okay, I'm ready. All right. So um, <laughs> one of the things that we talked about, like we, we're we not going to do too much. Um, you know, I could do a little shoulder thing. So one of the things that, and I'll just do a quick one, Madeline, so it won't change your timing too much. But I think one of the things I don't do with my older populations is I don't do joint mobilization, right, where I would be eliciting a mobilization or I would be creating force to mobilize a joint, but I often have my clients do mobilizations on their own. So why don't we get up? And if you have, if everyone has um, your uh, disc, right, or your tea towel, where's mine? I have one here. I'm going to grab it. Um, you can, oh, there it is. It's over there. So, how's that? Good. I think we're good there. I'm going to just angle this up a little bit. So, one of the things I often do with um, people who've been living long with shoulders is just like trying to take the, like, mobilize the glenohumeral joint by taking um, that joint without load through a full range of motion, right? So one of the things we could just do simply is reach your arm forward and you're gonna do distraction. So I'm gonna distract the humeral head from the glenoid fossa. I'm not changing my rib cage. And then I'm gonna reach my shoulder blade around my rib cage, right? So I'm here, I'm pushing on my heart so I don't change anything. And then to come back, I'm gonna go upper arm bone, I mean shoulder blade towards the spine, upper arm bone back in the socket. So that helps to mobilize the posterior joint capsule, right? So I'm gonna go reach and then shoulder blade, upper arm bone pulls back, right? And then reach and upper arm bone pulls back. Now we can also come down, hand facing my side body, but then I'm gonna also externally rotate and keep my side chest moving forward as I broaden through the attachment of my um, pack, which when the posterior joint capsule gets tight, the attachment of the pec gets super tight, right? So from here, I'm going to go internal rotation and external rotation, right? And I'm just like, this is a demo of just kind of like, you can take your upper arm bone into different positions and then go through a range of motion. Now I can bring my arm overhead and then I can also do a little internal rotation and external rotation and internal rotation and external rotation. Does that make sense? Let's do the other side quick, okay? So you're gonna go here. You're gonna go reach shoulder blade, upper arm bone back. So that mobilizes that posterior joint capsule, reach upper arm bone back. One more time, reach upper arm bone back. Now I could also, which we didn't do on the other side, I could take it into rotation and then bring my arms out to the side, bring this arm down and then neutralize my ribs, right? I'm gonna bring my arm down and then I'm gonna reach it back. So I could think about opening this and then doing internal rotation and external rotation, internal rotation and external rotation. 
And then I could bring my arm towards the ceiling. I'm gonna come low. And then I'm gonna do the same thing, deep internal, deep external, internal and external. It's a little limited on that side. Let's just do a full range of motion thing for our shoulders here. So I'm gonna go here and then I'm gonna reach my hands behind me, open through my palms, arms come down, reach back and then externally rotate and come around, right? And reach and down so my palms are facing back, hands go through to my bra line and reach and then around, right? So that's a simple way to think about mobilizing your joint capsule in your shoulder, right? Without actually eliciting force. Um, also, one of the things that I like to work on is, um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, in our, um, like just in programming for our older clientele, but clientele, any clientele, is like, where does the femur head fit in the socket, right? So a really common pattern for women after they give birth or um, just if they have this postural pattern that's sustained over a long period of time is that people tend to kind of drop their, their femur heads out, right? It's, this is not my pattern at all, but you know, inner thighs get weak, deep external rotators get weak. And what happens is the femur head does not approximate or doesn't compress into the acetabulum. And so, there's this feeling that there's not, um, that the midline is not connected and that people are depending on the lateral fascial system, right? So it often looks kind of like, you know, here, and then the femur heads jut forward, right? So I often think of, you know, my case study client, that's one of the things that she had. She's very, you know, generally very active, but she had lost her midline. Right. And one of the ways they worked on helping her get into her midline was to work her external rotators isometrically to help to compress the femur head into the socket as well as the inner thigh. So that's what we're going to do. All right. I'm going to go into a figure four stretch on the ground. Um, but it's actually going to become an isometric for the external rotators. So find a bit of wall. And then make sure, am I good? I think I'm good. Make sure that um, you, am I okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. You're going to go into figure four. And then um, without moving your hip points, you're going to push your knee into the wall. So instead of doing a stretch, you're activating your external rotators. Now, one of the things that I find is that people will, um, you know, that the external rotators can help to stabilize the SI joint by being the guy wires of the sacrum. And they also, with that kind of letting the femur heads drop out or not letting, but that kind of postural pattern is that um, the external rotators are long, right? And so this is holding the external rotators in a shortened position and really getting deep external rotator rate rotation progressively in an isometric hold. So I continuously push that knee back without moving my pelvis, good. And then let's do the other side. So this is uh, my arthritic hip and knee. So I go to this side and like, oh, my pelvis wants to do something funky. So I'm gonna check back into my sacral mechanics and my hip points I wanna have equal weight distribution bilaterally through my right and left sacrum. And then I'm gonna bring my left greater trochanter towards my sit bone on that side without changing my pelvic position. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Now I feel my external rotator is getting in the story. Um, now this hip, I dislocated this hip when I was in my 20s. So I often have that kind of pattern in this left hip of not having the deep external rotators pushing my femur head in. So I'm gonna get in it progressively spiraling a little deeper. Yeah, 
Now, if we're talking about inner thighs and external rotators working in concert to create proximity between the femoral heads or driving uh, the femur heads in, now we're going to try to kick up the midline and abductors here. So grab your foam roller and um, you're going to lie on it. If you don't have a foam roller, it's okay. But um, you want to find the space between the greater trochanter of the femur bone and the iliac crest. And that's what I'm lying on here, right? And then I'm going to bring my head down, create a nice uh, triangle to support my ear, and my side. On. And then I want to find my hip point balance, but also I'm going to get some low abdominal engagement over here, right? I'm not doing this. I'm not hanging out. I'm finding from tip to tail some engagement. I'm going to engage my abdominals. And then um, you're going to do leg lifts, right? So as I'm lifting my leg, I'm not um, letting my leg come too far forward in space. My feet are underneath my pelvis. The arch of my foot is underneath my pelvic floor. And I'm going to try to get some posterior glute mean engagement, which is one of the muscles that is consistently referenced as becoming weaker as we age in Western culture. So we want to make sure that we get good medial glide, good core stability and trunk control. And then you're going to pause and lower and lift the bottom leg. Now, when you do this, you can think about how all those adductors attach to the inferior pubic ramus, right? You can also engage that pelvic floor on that side, um, continuously creating length. So one of the things we talk a lot about in these case studies is the concept of biotensegrity. So I want to find length in all my cells. Yeah, last time, and then come down. Let's pivot to the other side. So you're going to roll. You can roll through your low abdomen. You can roll through your hips or just pivot over. And then um, <clears throat> you're going to do the same thing here. So this, I think there's a lot of bang for the buck on this exercise. I really like it. Um, we did not do like capsular mobility first in the hips, but you could do that with like some you know, internal, external rotation, lying on your back, um, going through the full range of motion without load of any joint helps to mobilize the capsule. And then we're going into local recruitment. So I've got glute need and I've got pelvic floor and TVA, multifidi, rotatories, little erectors through the spine. I'm lowering and lifting my leg. And then I'm going to go bottom to top. So pelvic floor. I'm fitting between two panes of glass here, right? From foot to the top of my head. I'm not like one part of my body isn't forward, one isn't back. Let's just do five more. Five, four, three, two, last time, one. Good. And then come on down. And then Maddie, should we go into more global movement or you want to chat for a second? Um, no, we could go into more global movement. You could just okay. reference uh, the gait patterning, you know. Yep. So one of the things that was, you know, that we all as contributors to this book talked about is like a baseline or reference point was um, assessing someone's gait as like, you know, as a baseline of assessment in the beginning of our case study and, the and an assessment at the end. And so it was something that I was consistently working on with my case study. And one of the things that we just were kind of strengthening was this idea that when you walk forward, right, and you unload this side, your pelvis, has to be able to eat your, your has to rotate on your standing femur head. And this glute need has to be able to lengthen and then shorten as you pass through, right? So I have to be able to lengthen and then shorten as I pass through to the other foot. So that's one of the things we worked on. Also, there seems to be some real indicators that 
if you have good trunk stabilization and abdominal recruitment and core control, that that is one of the things that can help you be adaptable if you lose your footing, right? Um, so that's one of the things we also did with that foam roller. I think for me, let's get out your little plate. When I was working with my clients in the beginning, I was like, okay, we need more, more butt. Like we just need more gluteal mass. So um, I did a lot of stuff like this. Like imagine this is your reformer and this is the, you know, the foot plate at the end of the reformer or, or the, the frame of the reformer and the foot bar is here. I ended up doing, I ended up doing a lot of this kind of stuff, just like lunging and then up and I'm holding on. This is my compromised knee. So it's a little hard for me actually today, but I'm, I'm really working on pelvic neutrality, right? Deep crease in the front of the hip, knee over the ankle. You can keep going as I'm talking through this. So also I'm not letting my knee drop in because I just worked on that isometric of that left hip and the glute med, which then can help me stabilize, right? It can help me stabilize my hip and my pelvis as I'm moving through this leg. So often when I did this in the studio, let's change sides. Um, the foot would be actually on the edge of the carriage of the reformer, right? And very low spring. And um, sometimes, <laughs> you know, my head is cut off there, sorry. Sometimes um, I'd have people hold on to the gondola stick or something like this, and you can do it here too. But coming in and out, all the same mechanics. Knee, um, kneecap is in alignment with your second toe. Your heel is super grounded right in the middle, right? This back leg is long. Your hip points are level. Your pubic bones are level. And your spine is long and strong, right? So I don't want to, this is one of my patterns to be kind of overarched, right? So I want to think about getting that thing organized, right? And I can still breathe. It's just I'm trying to pull my hip points and my pubic bone up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, also, we did a lot of um, glute work here, right? Where I keep getting my head out of the picture. I'm sorry, I'm going to lift it up a little bit, right? Is that doing things like a lunge, right, or a skater here. You can also do through with, with this disc, but just out and in, also working on good medial glide of the femur head, loading this hamstring, but glute need, right? So this, this whole system becomes capable of um, enduring an impact, right? are capable of being able to transfer uh, the body weight up a step or up a rock wall or up a rock, right? Or being able to come, like say you've fallen, right? Being able to do, like you don't have anything to hold on to, be able to do this so you can stand up. Um, is that cool? Should we talk Very more cool. and then go to planks and yeah, I think we'd love to uh, uh, maybe take a look at your case report. Uh, if you could describe who she is and a little bit of history yes. around her. Yes. So we can also talk about squats too, because um, why don't Hillary we go, go back? back? There one. you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is my lovely, my lovely guest. She said I could talk about her today. Um, her name is Joanne, and I had never worked with her. Um, I knew she would be compliant, and that's one of the main reasons I chose her. And um, she had never done Pilates, nor she had she ever done one-on-one -on -one strength training of any kind. Um, and she was an active outdoors woman, but not someone who ever thought about 
for strength and conditioning program. And so um, we worked a lot on her engage, engaging her midline, right? Pelvic floor, inner thighs, that stuff that I talked about with external rotators and um, glute med and inner thighs. And uh, we also worked on just getting her butt in the story and the strength of her quads and her hammies. Um, and so I had her doing like good form squats, but then we translated to um, the equipment, right? So doing just like simple, low loaded, like side, um, side splits and front splits and Russian splits. So really not overloading, but underloading. So she really had to um, stabilize the supporting hip. But I like this picture because a lot of times in teaching people good form squat, what happens is like we're looking for, um, like we want to have weight over the heels and the butt goes back. Like usually the way I cue it is you want to be like sitting on the toilette, right? And stand. And if someone has limited range of mobility in their hip or knee, or ankle, then holding on to the caddy can really help someone get good form. And I think that getting that good posterior glide through the femur head can really um, get weight through the heels, get good mobility in the ankles, because I think a lot of times what's compromised is ankle mobility. And so people can't get that weight in their heels, so they drive their knees forward. So, Hillary, can Kelly, we see photos? Uh, sorry, um, Madeline, uh -huh. pardon me, just one second. Kelly, given that uh, that there's uh, never enough time um, to hear yes. and see from you, could we, we'll just have a, a moment to take a look at how people can get in touch with you and then yes. come right back into your case report. Okay. Good. So we'll just have the, the closing side for, uh, for a moment and then come right back in. Uh, the, that's one. The, this one, um, Hillary, is just super. So this is how you can uh, get in touch with Kelly. Uh, we'll continue the conversation in moments. Um, her um, email for her teacher training and um, to look for her new educational portal. And here's her website, thewildwomenscouncil.com. Uh, just a reminder that on Wednesday, November 11, um, the contributing author and expert, uh, will be here with uh, you, you, you and with us, Rebecca Rothstein, uh, talking about bone health and Pilates applications. So, um, Kelly, back to you with your case report. Okay. Hey, Hillary, so I was going. Hillary, yeah, well, Hillary, can you just show us a um, quick, like, number six photo? And Oh, here's, that's good. This is the push-off yeah, so you were working with the... Yeah, so same thing at the edge of the caddy, right? Just training, um, plantar flexion, push phase of gait with a bent knee, right? Because as we know, one of the things that happens often as we age is that, um, you know, kind of a classic stereotype of someone who feels unsteady as they walk is that they widen their stance right? And they do more shuffling, right? Because, and so what happens is that the glute knee doesn't have to work, right? If you have your stance wide, um, if you're shuffling, you don't have, you don't get, oh, you don't get glute Achilles soleus, right? So one of the things I was really working on with Joanne was this idea of when she walks to push through her foot. And I feel like one of the things I see a lot is that people have a really hard time with this piece of the kinetic and fascial chain, right? It's just a feeling that they can push with that foot. So I do give quite a bit of that kind of stuff of like pushing and connecting into the kinetic chain and fascial system. We know the soleus press is a good way to kind of get that, that fascia between the um, soleus and tibia and fibula getting it mobile, right? I think I look at that, I do that exercise quite a bit. And then I also really like just simple, like bent knee calf raises, right? It's good for the vast eye group. And um, 
good for working soleus, right? And then straight leg relevates, which, you know, many of you do, but a lot of older people don't do. Exactly. Aw, she's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> I loved working with her. <laughs> so good form okay. squat. Yep. And then we have her, you know, one of the things we worked on is that principle I talked about is that we, to get her into her midline, we worked on isometric external rotation um, here to shorten up her external rotators because they were kind of long. And because they were long, her femur heads were kind of dumping out to the side a little bit. And so we worked on really getting her in her midline to her inner thighs and pelvic floor. And that was also part of, um, you know, some kind of pre-existing conditions she was struggling with too, in terms of pelvic floor strength. And so uh, that was a really, turned out to be a pretty effective strategy for getting her glutes engaged too, because once we got that midline recruitment, it helped hip mechanics, with, which optimized gluteus maximus recruitment, which I think is just a principle. Yeah, so strengthening, yeah, hip placement, hip joint placement is so important, you know, for all mm -hmm. aspects of gait, you know, with that connection of the core and the and the feet and the push off. Look at that smile. She's pretty happy. She's so cute. <laughs> I really well, thank you, Kelly. Her. This has really been yeah. uh, very informative. And uh, I look forward to reading your case report once we thank you. start editing more. Are we, are we going to talk anymore or is this it? I think we're done, and I we don't really. You know, really, um, I'm getting Ma Madeline, if saying, you're, uh -huh. uh, yeah, if you, if your um, if your time allows, um, I think we we have say say six more minutes. Um, so into the squats or the planks or um, some other yeah. demonstration would be great. We we do have one question from Martina. I okay. know, I know what? Martina too, which is amazing. Okay, and she wants to know the benefit of doing the leg raises on the roller versus if you were just on the mat. So I have my plug isn't working. My, my um, battery is going to die. So I'm just going to move. So, you know, the thing about um, the thing about that is it incorporates core control, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to balance on top of the foam roller. And one of the things I often find is that, you know, if we're talking about TVA recruitment, um, sometimes supine doesn't do it. Sometimes prone or quadruped doesn't do it. You're coming over here with me. Hi. Uh, <laughs> but that, is that working now? It's so weird. My, my yeah. charger doesn't seem to be working. Um, working. I got four. I've got four more, um, four percent left. So we've got four percent worth of charge to keep going here. <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, what I found is that doing it sideline like that helps to recruit TVA and multifidi, um, you know, under load. It's, it's like a lot of times we don't think of that sideline position as being a way to, to recruit um, intersegmental stability, pelvic floor and TVA, but I often feel like it's my favorite place to do that. Um, and it also works pelvic floor and inner thigh unilaterally. So a lot of times I feel like I can really, oh, I'm gonna really get this, my right side, or I'm gonna really get my left side of my pelvic floor. Um, and taking it back to this idea of, um, you know, falling is that a primary piece of inhibiting a fall is um, having core control. Right, so you become like, as opposed to just being dependent, like I'm walking around really dependent on my feet, I become more dependent on my center to be able to adjust and adapt. And I think that is really one of the, um, one of the hallmarks of training for not falling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anything else? Well. <laughs> okay, so they're going to share a link of the YouTube recording of the event so uh, people don't miss 
the after hour. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just so you know. Um, so I don't I know. Is there something else you'd like to add? Yeah. I, well, I want to thank you too, because um, I really appreciate, you know, I was thinking this morning, Madeline, about um, just all the opportunities you've provided people, you know, and you're providing me this opportunity in the, in the Pilates world. And I know I'm not alone in, um, in thanking you for all the opportunities and connections that you've created. I also feel like um, one of the things that we should be really focusing on for our older populations and ourselves is creating meaningful connections because as we all know, that's one of the primary indicators of health as we age is having strong connections. Um, even if it's virtually like this, right? I like to like, connect through the camera or <laughs> Um, in person or um, calling your grandma or your mom or showing up. Uh, I do a little work at a senior center here, like just showing up for our community in the ways that we can. And I think that that has to be part of our self-care practice and the care in our community um, because it could literally increase someone's immunity to call them, it could, it, it could increase my immunity to call you. So um, I think that, 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 that the literature is clear, that that is one of the primary ways to maintain health over a long life. And in this time when co the connection pandemic is, is, is upon us, like we have to proactively create connection in safe ways. And I think that that is really um, the thing I wish for all of us. And because you're a connector and Elizabeth, you're a connector. I just have more experience with Madeline, but clearly you both are creating this kind of connection that I thank you. And I, I have so much gratitude. I'm going to get emotional. I appreciate you and I appreciate you. Elizabeth. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. To keep the connections going. Um, you can always uh, be with us with uh, with Handspring, and you'll note that there there will be a slide for um, how you can uh, follow and uh, be be first to um, enjoy the chapters uh, Kelly's chapter in the book Pilates Applications for Health Conditions due out in 2021. And just as a reminder that. Um, uh, these Pilates Applications for Health Conditions builds on uh, the relationship that uh, Madeline and I have with Handspring and that each of our current books um, has a great deal of information that will uh, facilitate your work with, uh, with your older clients from, a, from birth and 30 to beyond. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. All right. Take care. Love you. Take All care, right. everyone. Bye. Stay well. Yes. Bye-bye.